Welcome to Marvelous Videos. I'm Rylan, and this is the Top 10 Creepiest Monsters from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Before Joss Whedon directed the epic film The Avengers, or ruined Justice League, however you look at it, he held the directorial reins of a great teen drama called Buffy the Vampire Slayer. The series followed the adventures of a young and beautiful girl from a small town in America called Sunnydale. She was chosen as the Slayer, who was given superpowers and other skills in order to hunt, fight, and destroy supernatural beings like demons, vampires, and other dark entities. Like other Slayers, Buffy had the help of a Watcher who guided, trained, and taught her. Initially, she wanted to live the pedestrian life of a small town girl, but Buffy soon started to relish the responsibility that she was given. Mine! I'll grow up! <laughs> Teen dramas came and went in the 90s, but this show enjoyed the luxury of a huge fan following from 1997 to 2003. Whedon had absolute artistic control over the project, and his creative mind reflects throughout the seven seasons. Even though he didn't direct all the episodes, his influence is visible in each one of them. It's a fact that a piece of cinema or television show is only as good as its villain. And oh boy, this one's got some epic and memorable villains. Where will they find you? Inside me you'll already be. Demons that force you to spill your secrets through song. Sentient beings that thrive on evil hiding in the depths of your heart. German demons that feed on diseased children and monsters that eat the skin of the living humans. As the talks about Buffy's return are making rounds once again, we decided to list some of the most memorable and scariest villains who graced the shadowy and grim town of Sunnydale. Some of these monsters Buffy fought and killed, some of them she exploded, and some she missed. So, put on your glove of Minigon and hold on to your ancient scythe, because this one's going to be a thrilling and creepy experience. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Durkindestad, from episode 18, season 2, killed by death. In this episode, Buffy is admitted to the hospital after she contracts the flu. She had developed a phobia for hospitals at the early age of 8, after witnessing her cousin Celia pass away in a hospital. Years later, Buffy has found herself seeking treatment, but she faces grimmer things than her fear. Initially, it seems that the hospital's doctor is conducting crazed experiments on the children, but his death reveals that the hospital is actually plagued by a demonic entity known as Durkindestad, which translates to the child's death. It's called Durkindestad. The name means child death. Kindestad would come in the darkness of the night to suck the life out of diseased children and make the killings look like natural deaths. Buffy learns that even her cousin Celia was a victim of Kindestad, and that she did not succumb to her illness. Buffy must eliminate this evil child killer and save the hospital from its sickening wrath. Kindestad will remain one of the sickest demons to have ever roamed Sunnydale. And it's not just his horribly grotesque appearance that brings him the negative claim to fame, but also his nauseating diet. The demon preys on sickly children by sucking their life through tentacle-like protrusions coming out of his eye sockets. Adults and healthy children cannot see him, so he does not target them. Naturally, Buffy had to reinfect herself after she got well, so that she could once again see the monster. But how? I can't even see it. You saw it once. Did I? Drakindestad is a German name, and the creature resembles a few bad guys from German folklore. 
but his modus operandi and victims suggest he is most similar to the German legend of the Pied Piper of Hamelin. The Pied Piper also wreaked havoc on a town's children by taking them away, and they were never heard from again. This evil musician comes from myths, and many historians believe that he was the personification of a plague that gripped German towns in the 12th and 13th centuries. Like the Pied Piper, Kindestad also feeds on diseased children. Aside from the legendary connection, Kindestad also bears a stark resemblance with Freddy Krueger of the Nightmare on Elm Street films. Freddy was likewise a child killer, who could be seen only by those who feared him. While Freddy used mental weaknesses to choose his victims, Kindestad opted for physical deficiencies. The Gentleman, from Episode 10, Season 4. In this episode, our young Slayer and her friends face an unprecedented challenge in the form of a group of demons who steal people's voices. Known only as the Gentlemen, the responsible monsters go from town to town in search of seven human hearts to feed upon. Seven windows knocking on doors. They need to take seven and they might take yours. As the residents of Sunnydale sleep peacefully, the gentlemen arrive in the silence of the night and steal the voices of the residents. The following day brings chaos because no one can speak. Buffy and her friends realize that this is the work of ghoul-like skeletal creatures. If they aren't stopped, seven people will lose their hearts and their lives as well. This episode, entitled Hush, is considered one of the best episodes of the entire show. For one thing, Joss Whedon himself directed and wrote the episode, and secondly, it has a rating of 9.7 on IMDb. Hush was the only episode from the show to be nominated for an Emmy. Many factors contributed to this achievement, one of them being the famous creature actor and mime artist Doug Jones, who played the role of the tallest of the gentlemen. The monsters are well-groomed demons in black suits, who wore a constant grin on their metallic teeth. Instead of walking, they floated gracefully above the ground. As their name suggests, they are probably the most well-mannered demons, as can be seen in their gestures and hand movements. Not surprisingly, these pale-skinned and bald beasts seem to hate any sort of noise, but their greatest weakness is the human voice. And that's the reason why they steal everyone's voices and keep them in a mysterious box. It's not hard to spot the similarities between the gentleman and Pinhead from the Hellraiser films, or even the titular vampire of the 1922 film Nosferatu. That potent blend is enough to send chills down anyone's spine. <laughs> Gnarl, from Season 7, Episode 3. Buffy and her gang go to the airport to pick up a friend, but there's no sign of her. It turns out she is fighting a skin-eating demon called Gnarl. The demon also kills a young kid who is painting graffiti on a wall, but didn't know that this was going to be his life's last little mischief. The Scooby gang is quick to learn that something is up, and they look for their friend as well as the demon. Look. I'm insane. What's his excuse? They reach a cave that turns out to be the Gnarl's lair and stop him from feeding on his skinny delicacy. Buffy fights the demon with her wits and fists and manages to save her friend, who is left paralyzed by the Gnarl. Camden Toy played Gnarl. He also played many monsters from the Buffy universe, such as one of the gentlemen and an uber vamp called Turakan. As mentioned earlier, Gnarl's appetite consisted of human skin, but in order to eat it, he had to ensure that his victims were not moving or struggling. And why not? We wouldn't enjoy a beef steak if it was trying to constantly run away from our forks and knives. Gnarl would paralyze his victims through a secretion that came out of his talon-shaped fingernails, and they would only be cured of the paralysis once Gnarl was dead. These long and sharp talons also helped him skin his victims' bodies, strip by strip. And yes, his victims would be alive while being eaten, ensuring that the skin was totally fresh. The scene where he peels off Willow's skin and eats it is simply scary and gross. Interestingly, magic didn't have any effects on this skin-gorging, ugly and horrific demon. 
In addition, his fear factor was increased by his perchant for speaking in rhymes, in a rather mellifluous and musical voice. To sum it up, Narl was a skin-eating and sing-songy demon who loved putting you down to a night of eternal sleep. Buffy, it's, it's after Mom. You guys stay in here. Don't leave this room. The Queller Demon, from Season 5, Episode 9. The Queller Demon is one of the many extraterrestrial demons of the Buffy universe. It's a hideous, slug-like humanoid creature that's called to Earth whenever madness runs rampant. It eats the brains of crazy people and uses a gooey substance to choke its victims. The Queller Demon lives in space on meteorites and hatches when it lands on Earth. In this episode, Buffy's mother, Joyce, develops a tumor in her brain and requires surgery. Initially, she is kept at the hospital, but when Buffy insists that she be allowed to take him home, the doctor agrees. Now, if this is going to be too much for you, we can make your mom perfectly comfortable here. No. No, no, I got this. However, unbeknownst to anyone, the demon attaches itself to the bottom of their car and comes to Buffy's house, where it attacks Joyce. Throughout history, and especially in the Middle Ages, the Queller Demon has been summoned various times, and this time it was Ben who called it to take care of the insane. It needs to walk to get... to get me. The creature showcased grotesque eating habits and looked hideous and slimy. Some of the scenes showed it climbing on walls or latching on rooftops. It's no surprise that this dysfunctional demon had a certain dexterity for discovering the demented. Scary. I'll tell you something though. There are a lot scarier things than you. The Ugly Man, from Season 1, Episode 10. Just like the episode featuring the gentleman, this one has a peculiar but gripping plot. Buffy and her friends begin to experience weird and unprecedented situations, such as Buffy's father telling her that she was responsible for her parents' divorce. One character loses all his clothing, except for his boxers. Buffy herself gets buried, and when exhumed, she turns into a vampire. Buffy? Thought I was dead. The characters soon realize that these events are their own nightmares, turning into reality. And all of this is related to a young boy named Billy, who's in a coma. Young Billy's coach thrashed him so severely that he went into a coma. The beating was obviously too much for the child, both mentally and physically. Billy Palmer was found beaten and unconscious after his Kitty League game Saturday. Doctors describe his condition as critical. Therefore, his fears took the form of the ugly man, who haunted Buffy and her friends. He even attacked one of Buffy's acquaintances named Laura. <laughs> He was a hideous monster with a burnt and deformed face. Instead of hands, he had two long and fleshy clubs with which he attacked people. The episode depicted astral projections for the first time and had a strange antagonist. It was hailed widely for the unique storyline and cinematization, but the underwhelming performances by a few cast members somewhat took away from the episode's brilliance. There. That wasn't so bad, was it? Oh, hold on. The Master. The Master was the oldest and most powerful of all vampires, and he was turned into a vampire by the demon lord Archaeus himself. Archaeus started his own vampire bloodline, and the Master was his foremost disciple. Soon after his conversion, the Master wished to open Hellmouth, a portal that would let the demons of Hell walk on the face of the earth and destroy all humans. The ritual began, but an anomaly led to a massive earthquake that not only destroyed most of Sunnydale, but also buried him under the rubble for centuries. And go, I am stuck here, here in this house of worship. Over this time, he accepted the help of many of his minions, trying to gain enough power to escape his natural prison. Though he failed constantly to do so, it was much later that he managed to trick Buffy herself and drink a little of her blood. The blood of a slayer gave him the necessary power, and he escaped, but his freedom was extremely short-lived. The Master was one of the most peculiar of all vampires who appeared on the show. For starters, he believed in the cause more than he cared for himself or anyone else. Despite being the leader of the Order of Aurelius, he believed that his minions were his children, instead of his slaves or disciples. However, 
nepotism was not alien to his so-called family, and he certainly showed preferential treatment to Darla and the Anointed One. The Master was the most ancient of vampires, and this magnified his powers to great extents. Despite spending more than 60 years in a pool of blood underneath the surface, he survived long enough to break out of it. Master. He developed control over his instincts and fear. That's how he had greater resilience towards the cross. Upon touching it, his hand let out smoke, but the weapon didn't do any major damage to him. His old and advanced mind was powerful enough to hypnotize anyone and everyone. It was so powerful that even Buffy failed to resist it and was rendered immobile by a mere wave of his hand. Other vampires usually turn into dust when stabbed into the heart, but the master transformed into a skeleton. This way, he had another opportunity to seek resurrection. All we have to say is that he's been aptly named as the master, and Mark Metcalf did an efficient job at playing the six centuries old master vampire. It would be awesome to see him again in a live action film where he would take on Buffy and her Scooby gang once again. The First Evil The first evil is not a man or a woman, it is neither God nor the devil. It's more like a sentient form of pure energy that has the power to trick and deceive others. It has existed since a time before the creation of the universe, through the Big Bang, and will continue to exist well after the universe witnesses its own final doom. In this right, the first evil is eternal and immortal. Naturally, it can be considered that the first is the very first entity to have come into existence, but its source of creation and its creator is unknown. Though the evil cannot affect the living world physically, it can do so indirectly by shape-shifting into the bodies of those who have died. It also has the most intricate knowledge of human psychology and physiology. This gives the first an edge over all beings, able to deceive them by taking various forms. In Season 3, Episode 10, the first made its debut and tried to drive Angel insane and trick him into killing Buffy. However, its plans failed when Angel decided to sacrifice himself instead. After this, it appeared in 15 episodes of the seventh season. Despite being incorporeal and intangible, the first is the embodiment of all the darkness and evil that people have in their hearts. It uses these fallacies and weaknesses to haunt people and drive them crazy, or turn them towards committing suicide. It is omniscient, and it comes to knowledge of dark magic, the occult, and rituals. When not disguising as dead humans or monsters, the first looks like a huge cloaked demon with gigantic talons and horns, making it feel very much like an apparition. If we think about the first evil on a macro level, we realize that it is the everlasting and omnipresent. It can never be entirely destroyed because it thrives on the good that resides in people's heart. And it's an unwritten fact that people will never be all good. There will always be a little evil in their hearts. Showtime. Sweet, from Season 6, Episode 7. Sweet was one of the most unique, persuasive, and compelling demons from the Buffy universe. His powers lay in the fact that his presence could force people to sing songs and express what lay deep in their hearts. These musical secrets often led to problems between friends and lovers, but that was not all. People would sing so much and for so long that they would suddenly burst into flames. Sweet followed certain rules, such as agreeing to marry the women who summoned him to Earth. In this episode, he was summoned by Xander with the help of a talisman. That's entertainment. However, upon his arrival, he saw the talisman in possession of Buffy's sister, Dawn, and figured that she was the conjurer. In a bid to intimidate Sween and stop him from taking her to his dimension as his wife, Dawn told him that she was the Slayer's sister. She'll get pissed if I missed see my sister's the Slayer. The Slayer? However, the plan backfired, as Sweet made Buffy sing and then dance. She was saved from bursting into flames by Spike, but Sweet insisted on taking away Don. It was only after he found out that Xander was the one who had conjured him that he bent his own rules and left the scene. The episode is arguably the best of the entire show, and the credit goes to the beautiful screenplay. Furthermore, Sweet is by far the funkiest and coolest Buffy demon ever. The most peculiar aspect of Sweet's appearance is his red skin and impeccable blue and red suits. 
He could hypnotize people with ease and make them sing and dance, and he could even generate background music items present in the performer's surroundings. The Judge, from Season 2, Episode 13. The Judge was one of the fiercest demons who initially seemed unkillable, but Buffy's quick thinking turned the tables on him. He was big, lean, and muscular, with the ability to burn people by mere looks or gestures. 600 years prior to the events focused on in Sunnydale, he was called upon Earth to judge people based on how human they were. Maybe he's broken. What the hell is going on? This one cannot be burned. Those who had even the slightest of humanity in them would be burned alive at his judgment. After a lot of struggle, soldiers managed to dismember his body and hid the parts in various corners of the world. However, all of the body parts were very much alive and conscious, waiting to be joined back together again. In the modern day, Spike and his vampire girlfriend finally managed to reintegrate him. Initially, the judge has trouble using his powers, but as time passes, his powers reach their epitome and he wreaks havoc at a Sunnydale mall. The judge's demise came as a result of his own ego. I think I got his attention. You're a fool. No weapon forged can stop me. He believed that no weapon was powerful enough to kill him. So, as Buffy shot a rocket at him, he just kept standing there, in harm's way, believing that he would remain unharmed. However, it seems that American rockets are potent demon killers. The judge was dismembered once again, and the Scooby Gang made sure that this time his body parts wouldn't reintegrate. The creature was portrayed by Brian Thompson, who is known to have acted in films like Terminator, Lionheart, and Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Angelus. Angelus is probably one of the most leading and most threatening antagonists in Buffy. He was born as Liam in Ireland in the year 1727 and led the life of a rich, spoiled brat. Upon reaching adulthood, his father chastised him for leading a decadent and immoral life. Soon, he met a woman named Darla, who promised to make him powerful and to show him the wonders of life. However, Darla was a vampire, and her way of giving Liam the time of his life was by converting him to be like her. After his conversion, Liam wreaked havoc on his small town of Galway and even killed his own family. Soon, Liam took up the name Angelus. Together, he and Darla visited various towns and cities to convert and kill people, and they built up a reputation as the deadliest vampires the world had ever seen. What would it be like? share the slaughter of innocents. However, in 1898, Angelus killed the daughter of a gypsy tribe's leader. The entire tribe cursed Angelus to live a human's life, and that's when Angelus got his soul back. The curse would be broken only after Angelus felt one moment of true happiness. He started repenting for the murders he committed in the past, and in order to redeem himself, he started killing murderers, rapists, and other criminals. It was these quests that led him to meet Buffy in Sunnydale. The two eventually ended up having sex, and Angelus felt true happiness, which ultimately broke his curse, allowing him to regain his vampirish self. Being a vampire, Angelus has superhuman strength, speed, stamina, and heightened regeneration. However, what makes him really dangerous is that he couples these physical strengths with a delight in psychological and physical torture. You crazy! Oh no! I'm a vampire. Once upon a time, he turned a mentally sound girl totally insane by attacking her family and friends. Turning the best of friends against each other is no big deal for him. The long life that he's lived has given him other abilities, like psychic connections with his victim, photographic memory, colossal knowledge of the occult, and demonology. Now, all of this comes with his charming personality and charisma. Interestingly, Buffy and Angelus' relationship was just like a fairy tale with the mortal enemies finding love for each other. However, as soon as Buffy had sex with him, he changed into a completely new person and became distant and mean. It's almost like relationships in present times when you think about it. Couples have sex, and then one of them shows their true colors. And what I've done. Now go. You are not staying here. I won't leave you. So you see, 
Angelus is not just a blood-sucking vampire from the movies or TV shows. He's an extremely sadistic, brutal, intelligent, and manipulative vampire. So if the fists don't do the trick, he has his wits at his disposal. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.